Good afternoon. My name is Susan Drodge, and I'm the Director of Advancement here at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's Alumni Networking and Education Series event. Thank you for being here. Our topic today is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on drug supply and utilization. This webinar is part of our Alumni Networking and Education Series events and is brought to you by the Office of Advancement here at our faculty. This series provides you, our alumni and friends, with relevant, thought-provoking presentations and discussions on the current hot topics in pharmacy and pharmacy practice. We're always looking for ideas for topics to cover, so please feel free to connect with myself or Tara O'Leary, our Manager of Alumni Relations, on topics you'd like to hear more about in the future. Before we start our event, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of Indigenous people and remains home for Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanted to remind everyone that there will be a Q&A period at the end of today's presentation and that questions can also be entered in the chat function on YouTube. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mina Tadros, who is our speaker for today's event. Mina is an assistant professor at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, a scientist at Women College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care, an investigator with the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network, and an adjunct scientist at ICES. He holds a PharmD from Albany College of Pharmacy, an MS from the University of Tennessee, and a PhD from the University of Toronto. Mina leads research focused on evaluating drug policies and post-marketing surveillance of medications. He works closely with policymakers and uses large data sets to answer questions about medications, real world safety and effectiveness, and improving the optimal use of medications. Through Mina's partnership with policymakers, his work has contributed to policy changes that have improved access to critical medications for patients. For example, Tadras led the ODPRN drug class review for chronic hepatitis B treatments that informed the policy expanding access to these medications and improving the life-saving treatments for thousands of patients in Ontario. His recent work, he has studied the distribution of naloxon by both pharmacies and public health agencies across Ontario. Public health agencies have used this information to build strategies to improve naloxone distribution in their regions. In addition, Mina is working to develop data-derived quality indicators to improve care. Through, his, through the, this work, he aims to help clinicians use data to improve prescribing practices, and he plans to expand this project to provide pharmacists with data to better understand it, their impact on patients. I'll now turn it over to Mina. Mina? Thanks, Susan. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And more importantly, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to, to talk about this very important subject and some recent work that we have been doing. So before we, we jump in, um, as Susan mentioned, you know, I'm here to talk about drug supply and utilization Within the, within the COVID pandemic. Um, but also, you know, this sort of story starts way before COVID and, and I hope to set that groundwork there. But as a, as a practicing pharmacist and for many of us on the line here, this is something that we continually see impacting our day-to-day -day practice. Next slide. So before I jump in, uh, I just wanna acknowledge that some of the work that you're gonna be seeing today has been funded by uh, grants and, and support from the Ministry of Health of Ontario, CIHR, uh, ICES, St. Michael's Foundation, uh, and awards from IQVA Institute for Access to Data. I have no personal or financial relationships relevant to the presentation. Uh, and again, the opinions, results, and conclusions are those of myself 
So if you want to get mad at somebody or tweet out something that I think you're not happy with, do it to me. Don't tell my bosses. Um, uh, and, I, and I will be presenting some fresh data here that uh, is still some of it has not gone under peer review. Uh, and so I'll, I'll highlight that when it's when it's important. But first, I want to really start off by kind of gauging the audience and seeing how important the subject is and how it's impacted you. So we're going to we're going to do a little experiment here. So you could take your phone up and scan the code or open your browser and go to poll ev.com slash alumni pharma 140. Um, and if you go there, you're going to see some questions that we're going to launch. And the reason for this is well to keep you warmed up. So it doesn't feel like a one way street here. But at the same time, I think that this is a, you know, an important topic. And it's good to know that perhaps when you're dealing with this at your pharmacy or wherever you're practicing that this isn't, you know, you're not the only one that's sort of dealing with this. And this is a bit of a, a major issue. So we'll give you a moment to kind of log into that. And so the first question is, do you deal with shortages day to day? This one's a, you know, if this was an exam, this would be a freebie. Get those votes in. So if you, if you can't see this at the top there, you can go to poll everywhere uh, on your phone and, and this, this should pop up. Feels like election night all over again, right, guys? We're... <laughs> but I promise we'll have the results soon. You won't have to wait a week. Amazing. So, and this is typical of what we see. So, 50% said yes. Uh, a third say no, and they probably work in other environments or they they're dealing with other things. And then 17% said maybe. So, over half are dealing with this some sort of shortage day to day. Next slide. So how much time daily do you spend dealing with drug supply issues? No time at all. So for those folks that said no, this is probably where you're going to land. Less than 30 minutes, less than an hour. So between an hour and 30 minutes, and then greater than an hour. Right. So not surprising here, about a third said no time. And those are probably the people that also said that they don't deal with shortages as well. But overall, you can see that, you know, 30 minutes or more um, was over half of people dealing with this on a day to day, dealing with shortages in some way. And this has been, you know, seen time and time again. CPHA has put out a number of surveys looking at this, but this is a definite time suck. So it's not just about patient access, but also the resources it takes to navigate this and something that we don't do well, and I think this will foreshadow some of the some of the information that I'm going to show you, is that this does have a massive impact. And these small shortages, even if they if there are a number of drugs, can start to really weigh down on our system and and really put a put a hurdle in the way of pharmacy practice. Next slide. And this is the third and final question. So annually, what percentage of your patients are impacted by shortages? So any single shortage at all, 
you can see here that, you know, zero to 25 or 25 to 50 are about the most common answers. And this, this is sort of in line with what we've seen in some of the surveys, where about one in four Canadians report that they or someone they know has been impacted by a shortage in the last two years. Now, the pharmacist, these numbers might be a little bit higher because perhaps you know about shortages that have been impacting them, but you're switching patients. So patients experience of shortages might be a little different than what you're seeing as impacting your patients. But these numbers are not surprising that in some way, regardless of what drug you're on, you're gonna have to switch generics, you're gonna have to switch something that you may feel that you're impacted in some manner. So, so the drug shortage problem is actually not a COVID problem. It really begins at a time before COVID. And we've been thinking about this problem for, for a number of years before COVID hit. And we started working through some ways to try to estimate it. And that was really the problem is that, it, you know, people were reporting that were happening, but we actually had no strong idea of why it was occurring and how often it was occurring. Now for the rest of this presentation, I just wanna make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So a drug shortage as defined by Health Canada is a situation in which an authorization holder for a drug is unable to meet the demand for the drug. Now that's a bit, bit wishy-washy when it comes to pharmacy practice. So for me, I think a drug shortage comes down to when you go to try to fill a drug, you can't actually get that patient that drug. Now, this could present in a variety of different ways. It might be a specific generic brand, but you're able to switch them. So in the eyes of that patient, they were still able to get the drug or the molecule, but a different formulation, but that would still sort of count as a shortage. But when we mean this, we understand that there's a diversity of ways that shortages uh, can present themselves. But in the end, of the end of the day, it's that there is a supply and demand issue and that when the patient presents to the pharmacy, they're unable to get the drugs that they need. Now, you only have to turn on the news every now and then to realize that this is a growing problem and it's received a pretty extensive issue. This is just a screenshot of, you know, if you just put in drug shortages Canada, there's over 105,000 results. This has been covered in a lot of different ways. And, and you know, the only thing that's consistent is how inconsistently uh, the drugs that it affects are. Sometimes it's blood pressure medications, other times it's antidepressants, and no single indication is sort of protected in any way uh, and no drug that we've seen, everything from IVs in hospitals to medications in the community to even epinephrine pens have been impacted in some sort of way. And so, you know, I, I think to say that this is a, what I'm going to try to sell you on is that this is a broad and continuing to grow problem uh, that is rather complex. So CPHA put out a, a survey here and what we found, what they found is that 25% of Canadians had either personally experienced or know someone who's experienced a drug shortage in the last three years. So I misspoke earlier, I said two years, but in the last three years. And one in 10 had personally experienced it in that time period. Now this is a little, a little outdated, uh, and I'm sure if we ran these numbers again, we might see higher values uh, as the number of shortages and their impact has really increased over time. Now we have some good insight into the actual results because in 2017, uh, we started collecting information. We mandated reporting of drug shortages. It, it's crazy to think before then, we had no idea what was going on. Um, and so you could see here over time, the number of drug shortages reported through the, through the drugshortages.ca website. And you know, one thing that I wanna note in this figure is that it's been pretty steady uh, for the last couple of years. No, the problem is not going away but also that in many cases they resolve really quickly, but there's also this idea of that there's constantly new active ones that are occurring. And so there is this, you know, an active one in some units of time can be over 50 active different drug shortages. Although there's thousands of drugs, this becomes a serious issue when you're thinking about a system or a population level at large. Now, when we summarize these numbers, uh, you can see that in the last full year that they had data, uh, 2019, there was close to 2,700 uh, different shortages with 346 active ones. So in many times they could say a potential shortage, but active shortages, there was over 300 shortages that happened there. Now in 2020, up until the point that this data was collected, uh, we need to update these numbers. There was over 500. And the reason for that was that COVID hit and things became even worse. And I'm, I'm foreshadowing this a little bit. So 
the FDA also has thought that this is an important, this is not a Canadian only issue. And I hope to paint the picture to you that this is a global problem because drugs and drug supply is a global issue. Um, and so they noted that there's this big spike that happened in, in, in sort of the early 2010s in 2012, and people thought that it was getting better. But then more recently, we've seen a secondary spike as the number of active shortages began to grow again. And so there's a lot of different reasons. In 2010, 2012, there were some major uh, mergers that happened in the market. Uh, there was also a vast introduction of a large number of generics, and they were slowly figuring out GMP practices. More recently, we've seen a variety of different reasons why this has happened, led by recalls, led by natural disasters, and we'll highlight some of those many different reasons. What's even more striking, it was data that the FDA presented looking at how persistent they are. So if a shortage happens, okay, that, that's a problem. The problem that we're now facing that's happening more and more commonly is that the shortage is hanging around. So the shortage occurs and then we can't get that drug for a long period of time. So a really good example of that Canada recently is Nargil, an antidepressant, where you know it's been a while since you're able to get it. In many cases, you might as well discontinue the drug uh, because you're no longer able to access it. So you can see here in the blue line that they've depicted is the shortages that are persistent for two years and over, and even more striking, five years or longer, where it takes that much time to bring back the supply, and perhaps you never get it back up to those levels that they were at before. So like I mentioned, we have some good insight into this, and we've made some movements in 2017 when Health Canada mandated that drug shortages uh, are reported to drugshortagescanada.ca. Now, within that, there was some mandatory reporting, right? So there was compliance verification, there was website enhancements into including uh, when you can actually report things and being able to easily search it. And then there was some monitoring that's added. So this, is, this has been a great tool. And, and to you know, when I speak to my international colleagues about this, Canada was the first country in, in many of the countries that we looked at that did this step. Now, a lot of other countries are starting to follow suit, but it was the first to allow insight into what was actually happening by mandating reporting of the inability to meet the supply needs. For those of you who have not seen this website, I, I recommend that you go there, uh, especially when you're unsure about why a drug you're unable to get it, whether you're a patient or a pharmacist or any sort of clinician that's interested in this, you can go look it up and the company will release information on if the shortage is actually active or it's potentially going to occur, the reasons why, and there's a lot of different information in there that's very, very useful and uh, it's all publicly available. So you can see here that, you know, from the summary of the screenshots there, they also published how many are actual shortages, anticipated shortages, and avoided shortages. Um, and so they also report things like discontinuations, reversals, uh, and if the reports are overdue or not. And generally, you know, they found that most companies are reporting pretty well, and they're ahead of the curve. So you'll see a lot of anticipated shortages that never actually precipitate, um, which is good news. So an important take home message here is that not all potential shortages actually become real shortages, but how do we figure that out? Uh, and how do we protect our patients from the onslaught of what actually happens? Now we spent a lot of time during the pre-COVID era thinking through what are the potential causes for shortages by just looking at some of those reports and you know, media reports that came in about all the potential reasons. And this is the simplest that we could get it. Um, you can imagine it's a dynamic of supply and demand but really, I think understanding drug shortages to, is to understand the supply chain. Now, there's many different components, and I'll start you here at that yellow box at the very far left. There's the API or the active pharmaceutical ingredient. That place that produces the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the drug that's in there, is not the same place that makes the FDF, the final dosage form. And that place may buy API from one place, make it in another factory, and then package it there and then distribute it. Now that goes then to a wholesaler, uh, which is you know, unique to each country and those distribution networks change. And in Canada, we have multiple different wholesalers that are regionally based and nationally based. And then those wholesalers will distribute it to pharmacies, outpatient clinics, hospitals, um, and then some sort of patient, and then they'll be dispensed to the patient and then there's the patient drug supply. So for it to, you know, many times, the shortage begins in the yellow box and then it takes time to actually precipitate to the point where the patient's unable to get it. Uh, and then that impacts their outcomes there. Now, for a variety of different reasons, all of these different arrows and ways that things interact with can be really impacted, right? So there's a lot of things that can impact the manufacturing, uh, the quality, maybe stop that, 
And there's things that can impact the distribution network as well. And so every single drug shortage has almost a unique story that can appear. And through a number of cases we've learned, there's a variety of places that it can go wrong. Um, but what we don't understand is which areas are sort of the most troublesome and which ones are most linked with uh, the drug shortages at hand. Now we can uh, hypothesize where we think some of the weakest links are. And I think COVID taught us some of those lessons and, and then we'll get into that. And the root causes, cause, causes of these drug shortages can be for a variety of different reasons. So I'll cover some of them, such as the economics of drug shortages, manufacturing and distribution is a major area. And then there's potential tools to address these drug shortages. And we'll talk about these at the very end, but there are market driven actions. And then there's what we would refer to as governmental actions or regulatory actions that are possible. So one major area, and when you saw that FDA figure and you saw that spike in a certain time was the business side of this, that there was consolidations in manufacturing. So a great example was that there was sort of mergers that were occurring in companies that made sterile injectables. And so in the fall of 2017, we saw a number of interruptions of manufacturing as a single firm led to shortages of multiple cr critical drugs for injectable narcotics, kinds, and other drugs. And so we learned a really important lesson there that, you know, in many cases, hospitals will procure from a single source. And so it became really important for them to better understand what happens if they're unable to meet those demands. Do you have a backup? Do you not? And, you know, in many cases with drugs, we have a number of generics. And so we feel comfortable if one of them is unavailable or a factory shuts down, it's really okay. But if you have a one single source that you're getting from and something happens to their business model, you can have a real cascade through the system. Shortages of critical sterile injectables, increased demand or manufacturing problems led to a variety of different shortages. And I would say that IVs have been really hard hit in the last two, three years, and especially were hard hit during COVID uh, for a variety of different reasons. But this is a great example of how manufacturing and impacting those sites and business decisions can really trigger uh, uh, drug shortages in a variety of different ways. Now, one other thing that can really impact things is these global issues. Um, but more importantly, even just natural disasters. So a really great example of this, and this was a learning point for me, was when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, uh, you would have thought, okay, that's, it's really tough for the people of Puerto Rico, but what does this have to do with me getting a drug in Canada? But little did we realize that Puerto Rico was one of the largest manufacturer of IV drugs. Uh, it had some of the largest biologics manufacturing sites in the world. Um, and because of it getting hit, there was a huge IV fluid shortage uh, there was a Baxter facility, if anyone knows, these men, Baxter is one of the largest manufacturers of those. And there was biological plants that were hit and there was an inability to get some biologic drugs. So a small island in the Caribbean getting hit by a hurricane sent ripples throughout the global supply chain. And this is where we start to learn the first lesson that this is a global issue. So what happens in one corner of the world can really impact the drugs that you receive in any part of Ontario, for example. Now there's a lot of hypotheses about the impact of pricing. And so the FDA and, and other folks have tried to look at this. And this is a, a good example of uh, ranitidine and famotidine pricing. So you can see here that the versions of the drug might drive different pricings in different ways. Um, and as you know, ranitidine had a number of versions of the drug that went up uh, and grew over time. And it was actually a bigger hitter, a bigger hit on the market than famotidine, which had less and less competition. But funny enough, what this is foreshadowing that we all know happened is that ranitidine is the one that ended up having a massive recall. And, and it was the one that we were ended up having to switch a lot of patients to famotidine. And so it really paints this dynamic issue um, around like that this is not as simple as figuring out which one is the cheapest and which one has the most formulations. And so there's more to it. Now, I'm not going to say that pricing and market dynamics don't have something to do with shortages, but I just do not think that it's that black and white. And so anyone who tries to paint that picture may be missing a large component of other things that are happening uh, within our supply chain. Lastly, and like I've said, the supply chain is international. So an important part of this yellow box that we're talking about here on the very far left that we learned is the vast majority of our drugs are made in China and India, especially APIs. So there's different estimates that you can look at. Some range from 60 to 80% of all drugs are somehow linked to India or China but there's a variety of other countries that they're made in. And when you look specifically at APIs, they're distributed around 30, 40 different countries. Now in recent forums, you'd say, well, why doesn't Canada just start producing all these drugs? Now the US has thought about this, a country that's 10 times our size. 
And they've quickly realized that for them to be able to produce all the drugs that they want, even just a short list, would not be economically feasible. You're talking about plants and each one of these plants could be upwards of a billion dollars. And so if you wanted to suddenly produce three, 400 drugs internally, you're talking about an investment of, you know, maybe $150 billion, call it. Now, is that economically feasible just to produce these drugs? And I, I think it's very easy without being an economist to figure out that that may not be the solution. But we also know that we're highly dependent on specific countries and any dynamic around globally, whether it's political issues or a pandemic, starts to impact that. And that lesson was very quickly learned with the experience with Valsartan. So we've seen a recent spike in recalls. And you know anyone who works in a community pharmacy can tell you what a mess Valsartan was and what a mess ranitidine was. But what we learned is that even with multiple drugs, so I thought before, if you told me Valsartan would go on shortage, I'm like, dude, we have so many different generic versions. That's not the drug I'm worried about. But little did we realize that all those generic versions were likely getting their API from the single source. And so when there was an issue with the API, all of them were recalled. And we had no insight into where the API was coming from. All we knew is that we had a number of generic companies producing these, and we had no insight into that fact. So 80% of these APIs are produced in China or India, which means we're heavily reliant on only two countries. You know, I'm starting to paint a red, you know, a red, a red flag here, but this becomes a real issue because one, we have no insights into where APIs are from, and often they all may be coming from the same factory. There's nothing to tell them they can't do that. And then second, we're heavily relying on single countries that if things go south with uh, political issues or anything that happens, we may be greatly impacted. So before we entered the COVID-19 pandemic, we knew that the drug supply really had a demand issue and we had no facility preparedness. Uh, we know that we, with the COVID pandemic, we were gonna have increased hospitalizations. And then we thought that there might be some patient hoarding. But again, like when this, I'm going back to January, February, as we were thinking about this pandemic starting to spread. And then we also started to see the clues that there might be a supply issue. There was manufacturing delays. China, which was first hit, started to shut down some factories. They started to limit import and export issues. And this became even more pronounced when certain drugs started to be rumored that they might be impacting it. And, you know, in the future, like as we move through the pandemic, what we saw is India and parts of Europe started shutting down the distribution of hydroxychloroquine. But what we also saw is a delay in new medication initiations. People were unsure of what was happening. And all of these factors triggered us as we entered the pandemic. But why does that even matter, right? So you have a bunch of shortages, maybe some people have to switch drugs, but why does this even matter at all? Now, the first thing is we have no insight into how bad shortages are in our country. We know that they happen, we do surveys, uh, we talk to pharmacists and everyone's telling you these are happening all the time and they're super annoying but there's really no way to look at how often they happen, their intensity and how long that they last. And we haven't been monitoring this whatsoever. And we have no, uh, no ability to actually know how much drug is inside the country. We have a few clues in the literature about why these drug shortages matter. So first, you know, a, very, a study that happened in 2012, there was a norepinephrine shortage that happened uh, from February 2011 to 2012. And in 2017, a JAMA study went back and looked at it and found that from switching from norepinephrine to phenylephrine during that time where they were unable to get those drugs, they saw an increased, um, an increased death or mortality increase of 3.7 percentage points. So 3.7% increased risk of dying uh, with an estimated projected loss of 13.7. That's from a single drug shortage. Now, this is a very important life-saving drug that's used very often in the hospital, but you start to see that you know, this is one of the very few studies that allows us to do that. The other thing we know from the data is that not all shortages actually lead or shift utilization. So here's a depiction of two shortages that happened around the same time. The Valsartan recall and shortage that happened in 2018. And around the same time, there was a shortage of certain bupropion formulations. Now, it doesn't take a statistician to notice that one line goes directly south and then the other line continues normally. And what I think this shows is that, you know, because what we found out with Valsartan is the majority of the products were affected by this recall versus in Bupropion they had other options, one shortage is not equal to another. Even though both drugs are used as often as each other, they both went in completely different trajectories. 
With the Valsartan shortage, there was a really great paper uh, that was published using ICS data that looked at the switching that happened in Ontario. And so among ODB patients, what we see here is that there was a massive switch to other drugs. Now, as most of you know, working in the pharmacies, what we started seeing happen is as everyone switched from Valsartan to other ACEs and ARBs, we started to see shortages in other ACEs and ARBs. Now, from an outcomes perspective, this wasn't the same story as norepinephrine. We saw a slight increase in ED visits for hypertension, but we're talking about going from somewhere around 0.15% to 0.2%, and it went back down. So from that lens, you would think that perhaps this shortage is not the same as the norepinephrine one, painting again the picture that not all shortages are created equal and not all drugs that get shorted or become sh shortages are the same. And so we start to see this confusing story where we can't create a single policy across all drugs and we have to take into account the diversity of drugs, their indications and their use. But they are a big deal, not just clinically, but on the impact on the healthcare system. So this is some data that we used IQVIA data from across Canada to look at the Valsartan shortage. So that blue line is actually the number of claims for Valsartan and the green line is all other blood pressure medications. So you can see when the recall happened in July, 2018, we see a sharp reduction in Valsartan across all of Canada. And we estimate that in one single month, 160 to 180,000 Canadians had to switch drugs. Now, Taking into account the survey that we did at the very beginning of this presentation of how much time you spend on it, faxing the doctor, talking to the doctor, letting them know, finding another option, speaking to the patient, perhaps sending them in for extra lab, lab tests, whatever has to happen, that is a huge burden on the healthcare system. So even though we could say, you know, clinically it may not have impacted a lot of people, even if it was a minor increase across the population level, I think even from an economic perspective of burden on the healthcare system on both prescribers and pharmacists, this is massive. When you have something like this, like you know, close to 200,000 patients in a single week coming in to switch their drugs, that's a lot of pressure on the system. And a system that's already overburdened uh, and, and running on fumes, if, you know, if we all know this truth. So up to this point, I hope I painted the picture that shortages have been not getting any better. They're complex, they're global, they vary in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different reasons that they can happen, um, but even from a clinical perspective, they can have a huge impact, but also from an economic health system perspective, they can have a huge impact. And so, you know, the bottom line is it wasn't a good news story as we entered COVID and we were worried about what was going to happen. And when COVID came in, it was really the perfect storm. We saw a disruption to the global supply chain, like I mentioned earlier. We saw increased demand for some medications and treatment shifts, and we saw the toilet paper syndrome, right? We saw fear and stockpiling on both a personal patient level, but also, as I'm going to show you in some data, on a system-wide level. Uh, and this became really scary, and it really showed, like many things that COVID did, the cracks in our system uh, of how we distributed drugs. Going back to that framework I painted for you about all the different points, we sat down and said, okay, where can COVID be hitting? And you can see this thing is just riddled with all those red stars, which is a potential spot. Everything from factories shutting down to wholesalers not distributing right, to patients increasing demand, to new treatments coming out that needed an increase in how they were being used, to a shifting healthcare system that was using different kinds of drugs. But there was some silver lining to this. People had been thinking about drug shortages beforehand, and they use this as a wonderful opportunity, as, as bad as COVID is, to try to force some of those policies. So the good news was that they'd been thinking about this, and suddenly they could do some policies. So we did a scan to look at all the different policies around North America, Europe, uh, and Oceania, like all the different types of policies that potentially could be used. Now, what we found is that they fell into three different types of areas. A lot of people started copying Canada, doing monitoring policies to better understand the shortages and discontinuations. They monitored their national levels. Canada actually even improved on that. Health Canada started mandating that companies for certain drugs tell them how much was inside the country. They had regular updates of drug shortages listed on their websites, just like Canada served as the lead. To mitigate the impact, they started allowing temporary orders and good manufacturing practice flexibilities. Some countries, bad news, good news, started to restrict exports so they can make sure that they hoarded or had their own medications on hand. 
Um, there was conservation strategies, right? The one month supply limits. That wasn't just an Ontario thing. That was used around the world in a lot of different places. And the fact that the shortages didn't get worse may mean that in hindsight, that was probably maybe a good thing at the time, at the time where factories were shutting down around the world. And they also looked to prevent occurrences. So they set, it, set up guidances for industry to evaluate their entire supply chain. They proposed policies to manufacture to improve critical infrastructure, and they increased capacity and production quotas. But to me, even greater than all of this was the fact that it suddenly put pressure on policymakers at a broader level to know that this was a problem. And so much so that the US declared that the drug supply is actually a national security issue. They understood just like food and water, you need to ensure that your supply is there for your country uh, in a time of crisis. And unfortunately, when times were tough, we saw that there's these new factors like geopolitical issues that can start entering into the frame that would make it harder for drugs to be distributed. Uh, and really, you know, that we have no, we have no treaties to say that one country can't suddenly stop sending its drugs to other places. If you are not happy with that president, you could stop sending your drugs. And there's no treaty sign. You can't do that with water. You can't do that with food. You can't do that with weapons. But yet with drugs and vaccines, we're seeing that there are no rules for how things can be distributed in that sense. So we worked with a number of policymakers, and the one thing we kept hearing is they needed to know what was going on. So we launched two separate projects, and I'm going to show you just a sneak peek at some of the data we saw and the pictures that we saw to allow us to better understand what was happening in Ontario and what was happening internationally. We talked to stakeholders and pharmacists and clinicians and said, okay, what are the things you're worried about? And this is what we got. People were worried about vaccines, so influenza shots. They were very worried about inhalers, rescue inhalers, so albuterol and salbutamol specifically. The reason was that hospitals were using more and patients were worried. They were worried about opioids, mental health drugs, ACEs and ARBs, some potential treatments, hydroxychloroquine, I laugh every time I still talk about that, and antivirals. And so those are the drugs that we kind of concentrated at first and began to better understand them. We knew that there were spikes in some drug shortages. There were shortages of hydroxychloroquine, salbutamol, azithromycin, and other COVID-related inpatient treatments. There was a policy reaction to this, right? We knew that there was flexibility in pricing. They allowed the introduction of private labels. There was expedited reviews for a lot of drugs and ex exceptional importation for specific drugs. I don't know if anyone saw, but they started bringing in inhalers from other countries to, to meet the demand uh, that was happening at the time. So the first tool, and I, and I invite you to go play around with it, we launched it, uh, was the COVID Ontario prescription drug utilization tool. And we're still continuing to update this data and monitor it throughout the pandemic. And all those drugs that we listed, we've been monitoring on a week to week basis. There were sort of three take home messages that we found. The first was that there was an obvious increase in chronic drug prescription volumes mostly because we switched to a 30 day supply. Now, as we went back to the 90 and 100 day supply, that went back to normal. The second is that consumers reacted to proposed COVID treatments. We saw a spike in hydroxychloroquine um, and even Canada was not immune to sort of tweet media uh, and the impacts of this. And so we saw that spike even in drug claims that were filled. And the third thing we saw was that patients and organizations stockpiled. And this was very obvious with inhalers, where we saw a 30% increase in Ontario's ODB claims for inhalers in a single week. We also saw this with insulin. These were drugs that people were worried they were not going to get their hands on. And, you know, this spike is off, obviously, this demand spike is obviously what led to the shortages that hit the country. Now, I invite you all to go play around with the tool and we'll continue to update this throughout the pandemic. And that gave us an Ontario picture. But was Ontario any different from what was actually happening uh, around the world. So what we were able to do is actually leverage some IQVIA data that we, we got through an award through the IQVIA Institute to start looking at this uh, in a global fashion. And we got access to data from about 90 different countries to explore was one, Canada any different than anywhere else? And were different countries dealing with this uh, better, worse, what was the global impact? And this became really important because we knew that the drug supply, like I've continued to say, one of the major themes today is a global issue. 
So we can't think about this in, in our own silos inside Ontario or inside Canada. We had to take a global perspective at this. Now, this is some early data that's still going to be published. Um, but what you see here is the monthly utilization of all drugs around the world. Now, this is a, a, a sort of like a, what we call a, <clears throat> a, 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 like for each month, you sort of see the random distribution and you can see how wide the variation is. I wanna draw your attention to the very far right there, the one line that kind of stands out. That is March, 2020. So around the world, we suddenly see a massive spike in the ordering of medications around the world. And in the second month, they don't need as much and it drops. And this was a theme across every single drug. And it became very interesting. Now, not every country did the same, but in all 69 countries that we evaluated in this analysis, we saw the same trend. In March, everything spiked as they ordered as much drug as they could, whether it was health systems, people, or countries, they all seemed to do this. Now, if suddenly you see a 20, 30, 40, 50% spike, there's no way your supply is gonna keep up. So it is not surprising that because of our reaction to the potential of the pandemic, that we ended up seeing drug shortages spike around the world. Now, what was also interesting is when we thought about developed versus developing countries, you see that developed countries had a much larger spike on average. And the reason for that is they had more money they were hardest hit by COVID in the very beginning. And so they sort of took the lead on ordering a lot of these medications. Now, I think the second drop you see in April right after is because many of the countries realized that they overordered some drugs that they definitely didn't need. And so it was an overreaction, but the, the damage had been done. The supply chain had been affected and it shows that not having a coordinated supply chain around the world really sets us up for disaster. If this had been worse, if there had been medications we needed, or in what we're seeing now with vaccines, countries fighting for vaccine supply, if we don't have an organized manner to deal with this, you get a really big mess. Now, when we went country by country and we looked at the percent change of March, 2020 versus March, 2019, you see that around the world, those, all those countries that are greens or blues had an increase in March. The only country with a reduction was China. And the reason for that was because they'd already passed their wave, right? They were the first ones hit in February. And so they were able to clamp down on their supply and then they began to reopen their factories and distribute around the world again. But you can also note that the variation differs. Some countries only went up by 10% or so, and some countries nearly doubled the drug supply that they were ordering. And these controls mean that there's no ability to control for that. Now, there are factors like how drugs are distributed, how much drugs they initially use, and a lot of these factors play into this, but I think this clearly depicts that the world responded uh, and, 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 and every country was just kind of a, it was a free for all. And you can see here the sort of a different way to depict it rather than a map that from some countries you had nearly a doubling in ordering compared to the month before. Um, and around the world, you mostly had an increase of about 30 to 40% uh, in, in what they ordered or what they were able to actually use. Now, when we dive into specific drugs, so this is a figure here showing hydroxychloroquine, the infamous, um, you can see in the month of March, when those tweets went out and people thought that this drug was the new cure, we saw a doubling in the amount of hydroxychloroquine being used around the world. So what? Cheap drug, doesn't matter. But there's people that use this for malaria. There's people that use this for RA. You know, this is a drug that mattered and we started seeing shortages after and people weren't able to get their hands on this drug. Interestingly, the blue line there is the developed countries, which traditionally use less hydroxychloroquine because they don't have as much malaria in many cases than the, 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 the green line, but they somehow increased the amount. They overordered, taking probably away supply from other countries, which we're seeing again uh, play out in the vaccine picture. When we took a handful of countries to kind of look at them, there was a global average of nearly 40% spike in that single month. This is again, March, 2020 versus March, 2019. Now Canada, uh, as you saw earlier in the Ontario data was in the 20% range or so. So we were below the global average and below our friends to the US who are above the global average. But I guess you can always look at your neighbor and say, well, at least we weren't as bad as Brazil, Poland, or Italy in the sense that they saw as big a spikes there. 
But still, you know, I think thinking that Canada was somehow protected from the impact of fake news or any social media impact would be ignorant. And I think we need to realize that in this global community, as news fired off, Canada was not immune. And I, and I think this data clearly depicts that. The other drug we've been talking quite a bit about that I want to sort of illustrate to you is the use of salbutamol. And this is the Saba inhalers that we were talking about earlier. And so, you know, although there were stories about the hospitals using it, the biggest spike actually wasn't from the hospitals, it was in the retail sector, which is the highest user of a salbutamol. So as many of you know, hospitals started switching to use inhalers to try to limit the spread of COVID, thinking if the nebulized formulations were used, it would spread more easily. So you do see an increased spike as their protocols switch to inhalers, but those rumors and people needing it, I think there was more pressure on patients to get inhalers because COVID was a respiratory illness and people were really worried about the shortages that may happen. But it's, a, it's sort of a, just like toilet paper, the moment you think it's gonna run out, more people went in. And I'm sure I would love to hear lots of stories of people on the front lines, and I saw it, of people coming in trying to get as many inhalers uh, as they could before they can run out. Now there wasn't a shortage when they were coming in, but that action itself is what led to the shortage itself and forced Health Canada to allow importation of, uh, of medications that were intended for other countries. Now, when we look at this picture with the global average, Canada was well above the global average in its use, but we weren't the only country. Some countries had up to 40, 50% spikes just in that single month. And so again, you see this wide variation with some countries decreasing and some countries increasing. So it's not uniform how countries reacted, but it is uniform that the, around the world, there was definitely uh, an increased spike. So I wanna just end on two notes. I've pointed out that this issue is global. I pointed out, and I hopefully have sold you on why this is an important issue to be concerned with. I feel like at this presentation with many pharmacy school alumni, I'm preaching to the choir, so it's a home field advantage here. Um, but how do we solve this? And moving forward, what does this all mean? One of the submitted questions before uh, this presentation was, so what does this mean after COVID? And I think there's two ways to think about solutions. There's the local or institutional level, and there's the policy level. At the institution level, I think we need to do a better job of tracking drug shortages to plan ahead. When that shortages is potentially going to happen, I don't, you know, I do this all the time. You go in to order from, you know, KNF, McKesson, whoever it may be, and then you can't order the drug and you freak out. But then you realize that they reported the shortage two months ago. Perhaps we should have been thinking about which drugs might happen and talking to our patients before we can't order it so we can start dealing with switching. You know, you don't want a situation like where you have 180,000 patients all switching on the same day. We need to find alternatives ahead of the curve. We need to share resources with each other to let each other know what shortages are coming, uh, and what are potential solutions, and sort of develop guidelines of how to deal with them as they come. You can have ethical decision-making. You know, some drugs are used, especially in hospital, are used for a variety of different indications. And that same drug for some is crucial, and for others is a nice to have. And so I think times where there's shortages ahead of time to salvage and save supply, we should be thinking about limiting them at the indication level, that there's some they don't need and some they do. And I think in the outpatient, we're going to start seeing some of those same things, where some drugs, there's lots of alternatives, and in others, there's limited factors. So I can only imagine, for example, for some biologics, if we had a shortage in specific biologics that are used for both RA and IBD, you know, RA has many more biologic options. So perhaps we might be okay to start limiting patients or controlling those. This is a hypothetical, but, you know, thinking through where they're used and mapping that out is probably pretty important. The last thing is we're really horrible at connecting with other institutions. You know, I have a WhatsApp group filled with pharmacists that share when there's shortages and what they have on there. That's not an effective way to share and know what's on people's shelves. Some people, especially for some of these more rare drugs, might have some on the shelves and they don't realize it. We need to do better at how to share supplies and let people know what's out there. On a policy level, I think I've repeated this over and over again, we have no way to measure how much drug is inside Canada. We have no way to know how much is left in the drug supply chain. We have no insight whatsoever and we need to improve this. We also need to improve how much we know about drug shortages of who's impacted by them. We need to develop a risk strategy and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. We need better formulary management that accounts for the risks. So an essential medicine list or an at-risk medicine list for manufacturing that will help us use some of these policies in different ways. And we need to improve our contracts. So hospitals are starting to do this, but we don't do this in the community. If a manufacturer is unable to meet the requirements for demand, 
there needs to be some sort of contractual agreement about how those costs are switched. If we need to start using brand name, that difference should be made up by people who are, you know, by the generic companies in some way, if they want that contract. And this is starting to be used more and more commonly. Uh, and, and I anticipate this will become the norm moving forward. The last thing, and I, and I wrote about this in a, uh, in a recent article in the Globe and Mail, was that I think a lot of people have been talking about an essential medicines list of what we need to produce internally. I think that that's very important, sort of categorizing drugs as essential, red, yellow, green. What I urge people when they're talking about this to consider is that there's not just clinical risk of what's important, although we showed that, right? A norepinephrine shortage is not the same as a valsartan shortage on the outcomes. But we also need to understand our supply chain risk. So supply chain risk of, are we, do we only have one generic version? What countries is it made in? Where's the API made? If we get hit in one place, is it gonna ripple through it? And it's the combination of risk, of clinical risk and supply chain risk that's going to help us develop a better risk strategy so that when we use things like investing in uh, domestic production, uh, mandating use, changing prices, whatever it may be, we need some sort of framework to work through these to better understand them. And this is the work that we hope to undertake in the next few years as we build this at-risk framework uh, and better understand where we should be taking the next actions. So with that, I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and listening to something that I am, as you can tell, extremely passionate about. I invite you to go play around with our tool. We'll be posting a lot of the publications that are coming out in this area. So please follow ODPRN, uh, follow myself on Twitter and, and say hello. Um, and please, you know, let me know about shortages that you're seeing, things that are important. You know, this is a building area that I'm, I'm very passionate about and I would love to learn from all of your experiences on the ground. So with that being said, uh, I will open up to questions and allow people to, um, yeah, ask those questions on the box in there. So there was one question that came in around the impact of COVID uh, and what it means going forward. And I think I talked about this at the end, but I do think that a lot of policies have allowed us to, uh, to develop policies now in COVID. And I, and I, and I, and I hope and I, I think that the momentum that we're going to see from those that happen and all the lessons that are learned are going to push us further and further into developing more and more policies. There's, there's been an inertia on this topic. And I anticipate, I'm very positive that we're going to see a lot more great, um, uh, great policies that are going to present themselves and we're going to learn from them. Uh, and, you know, I think we're going to start tackling this problem. Are we going to eliminate drug shortages? Probably not. But I think we're going to curb them and potentially improve our drug supply. So there's a question that came in around what's behind stock transferring and selling between wholesalers. I, I can't really comment on the business model of why they would be doing this. I, I do know that uh, behind the curtains, uh, there were a lot of discussions between wholesalers as certain drugs spiked to, to begin limiting it. And I, I'm sure many of you saw this, where you were ordering a drug uh, and you wanted five inhalers, but you only got two. And I think that was some of the kind of coordinated effects between wholesalers to control the supply chain uh, as they worked with Health Canada, as they worked with distributors and manufacturers to figure out how to get their hands on more of those supplies. Um, and so, you know, those are kind of uh, an important factor. Now, why they would sell to each other to hold supplies, it might just be based on regional factors to get drugs out, uh, to make sure that there's a supply distribution without it. There's a question that just came in saying, can you talk about policy initiatives to empower pharmacists to manage these shortages independently? Absolutely. And this is something that many of us in this field have been pushing on. So the Valsartan example, I think, is a textbook example of why this is important. If we had empowered pharmacists the ability to suddenly switch to an equivalent ARB or an ACE uh, and work through those to be able to prescribe and initiate new drugs around the country, can you imagine the amount of time saved that rippled through the system that would have helped us navigate that much easier rather than having to fax every doctor, pull a list, demand that they switch it over, wait for the answer, realize the patient came in, they didn't have the answer, go get a new one, et cetera, et cetera. And so some of these uh, expansions of practice would have allowed us to mitigate this in an easier way and potentially at minimum 
cut in half the amount of time that was needed because you would you would allow uh, the the ability for pharmacists to navigate those much easier. Now we can have guidelines and recommendations that come out to help patients and pharmacists navigate these much easier on a standardized level. Uh, but I think those kind of policies would really help um, mitigate the impact of these shortages. So thank you very much. Um, for attending this. I hope that this was insightful. Again, please connect with me and share your stories uh, and anything that you see on the ground. I'm always you know, ready to learn from everybody out there. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And uh, 